know, if you're just joining us, you know that we, we, we've been going through this book. We're in our third week of what's going to be a 12-week series uh, as our small groups are also studying this book. And today we're going to come to the end of chapter 1, okay? So we're coming to the completion of the first chapter. And so go ahead and turn your Bibles to James chapter 1, and we're looking at verses 19 to 27, okay? And uh, as you're turning there, let me warn us in advance that this is not an easy message. So uh, brace yourselves, prepare your hearts Uh, This is a difficult message. Uh, At least it was for me as I prepared it this week. I I really struggled myself. uh, Because today in our text, James is going to challenge us very strongly to do what you hear. I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, do what you hear. It's the title of our message. Do what you hear. And this is one of James's main concerns in this book. It's one of his top concerns that we who are Christians, we who declare ourselves to be Christ followers, people who have been saved by faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we do what we hear. Because genuine faith, James is going to say, it is evidenced by this. By doing what you hear. In other words, real saving faith, it is demonstrated by the fruit of obedience. And so for those of us here today who maybe do not live in obedience to God's word, who don't do what we hear God say in his word, this will be challenging. It should be challenging. But I really, hear me on this, I really hope and I pray that nobody today walks away feeling condemned or discouraged. Because that's not the heart of the message. Okay? And that's not James's heart either. Okay? James is not writing this to try to condemn you or discourage you. Okay? Rather, James is writing this with a deep pastoral concern. He's very, very concerned about the people that he's writing to. He's writing with this deep concern because he does not want anybody to be self-deceived into thinking that they're okay when they're not. Because that would be the most horrible and dreadful place to be. To think that you are saved, that you're okay, when actually you may not be. To live all of your life as a Christian, believing that you're a Christian, only to find at the end of your life when you stand before Christ and he says to you, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoer. Like there is nothing I could think of that would be more horrible and dreadful than that. Right? And and God does not want this for any of us. In fact, that's the reason that you're here right now, if you're hearing this. He doesn't want this for any of us, which is why he has James write this passage to warn us, to challenge us, to convict us, to live as we ought to. To live as the redeemed and the renewed children of God that we are in Christ Jesus. And so I really pray that this message, it moves us in the right direction. Not not to a place of condemnation or despair, but to a place of conviction that leads to repentance, that leads to obedience, that leads ultimately to life. That's what I hope for us. But this is something that I can't do. (laughs) This is something that the Holy Spirit must do. So let's pray. Let's pray right now and let's ask that. And I want, to ask, I want you to ask that for your own heart right now. Holy Spirit, open my eyes, open my ears, and open my heart to not just hear your word today. I want to hear your word. That's important. But Lord, more than that, help me to do your word. Help me to be a man. Help me to be a woman that does your word. Just pray that over your own heart right now. I'm praying it over my heart.
Father, we ask this in boldness, in courage, in assurance that you will give it to us as your sons and daughters in Christ Jesus because of what he has done. Empower us by the Holy Spirit to see you in your word, to hear your voice, to draw closer to you today. Open our hearts, our minds, our understanding that we might obey you, that we might live the life that you've called us to live. We need your help, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, James chapter 1. Let's look at James chapter 1. And uh, I actually want to start by reading uh, verses 16 to 18, which we actually read last week. It's not in your bulletins, but if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to look a little bit before to verse 16 to 18. Uh, We read it last week, but I want to read it again because I think that it will give us a proper foundation before we begin, especially like a message like this, okay. Uh, So James chapter 1, let's start in verse 16. James said, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Okay, and if you don't remember what James was talking about, he was talking about temptations. He's saying don't be deceived about temptations. God is not the source of your temptations. He's not the one tempting you. Okay, but rather, verse 17, every good good gift and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In other words, God is good all the time. God is good. He is not the one out to tempt us or try to destroy us or try to lure us. No, he is a good, good father who gives good things to his children. That's who God is. That's who he is. And he never changes, James says. He always does what is good. And then in verse 18, uh, I love this verse, very important verse, James points us to the ultimate expression of just how good our God is. Verse 18, he said, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. In other words, the Father chose us. We talked about that last week. He adopted us into his royal family to be his children forever and ever and ever. And he did this, James says, by the word of truth. That's the gospel. Okay. So he saved us. He redeemed us by sending his son Jesus to die on the cross in our place for our sins. So that through faith in Jesus we could be totally forgiven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we could have his perfect life, his perfect righteousness, his perfect status as a blameless and and beloved child of God. All of this is ours through faith in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I think there should be some more hallelujahs. Hallelujah, right? Hallelujah, through faith. And the reason that the Father did this, James says at the end of verse 18, don't miss that, End of verse 18, he says, so that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creature. That is why we have been saved. Now, we didn't talk too much about this word first fruits last week. But in the Old Testament, that word first fruit, it, it referred to the first fruits of the harvest. Okay, The very first fruits of the harvest, they belong to God. They were his. They were to be dedicated to him. And so in that sense, uh, James is saying that, we are first fruits. We belong to God. We are His. Praise the Lord. But another idea behind first fruits, which James is really getting at here, is that Christians, you and I, who belong to God, we are the first fruits of the new creation that is coming when Christ returns. In other words, let me just quickly explain that. Within the big picture of God's redemptive plan, God's redemptive plan, that that means his plan to redeem the entire creation, okay, to make all things new. At the end of history, we know God is going to restore all things to the way that they were supposed to be. That's what Revelation tells us. All things. He's going to make right every single wrong. That is where history is going. Okay, that's where it's going. Within this big picture, right now, in the present, right now as we live our lives, Christians, 
are the first fruits of that. Do you hear that? In other words, Christians, the church, that's all of us right here, we are a glimpse, a preview, a picture of the new creation that is coming. Now, admittedly, I'm sure you're thinking this, we as the church, we are often a blurry, <laughs> kind of dim, kind of damaged reflection of this, aren't we? A lot of times the church can often look nothing like the new creation that is coming because of sin, because of brokenness. We still sin. And that is a shame. It really is. But you need to know the reality is, the truth, that is what the church is. We are to be a glimpse as first fruits to a broken and hurting world of the new creation that is coming. That's our identity as Christians. That's who we are in Christ. We are first fruits who belong to God and who are a foretaste of the new creation that is coming. So when people look at us, they're supposed to be able to taste like, ooh, it tastes pretty good. <laughs> it's a foretaste of what's coming. Now, this is very, very, the reason I'm bringing all this up before we begin is because this is really important to understand as our foundation, okay, who we are in Christ. The fact that we are first fruits, that's who you are. You are a first fruit. Turn to the person next to you. Say, you're a first fruit. Can you believe it? You're a first fruit. That's amazing, right? We don't really say that to each other, but we should. You're a first fruit. You're a first fruit. And the reason that this is important for you to know this is because if we're not grounded in this, if this is not our foundation, and what can happen potentially is we could take this passage and really the entire book of James and we can kind of misapply it in a way where we try to earn our salvation, where we try to work for our status as a first fruit, where we think, man, I really got to obey in order to be a first fruit. Man, I, I really got to obey or I won't be accepted as a child of God. But hear me on this, brothers and sisters, that's not the gospel. In fact, that is anti-gospel. That goes against the gospel. The gospel declares, as we should all know very well, it declares that through faith in Jesus Christ, you are saved and you are accepted by his perfect record. Amen? Amen? By what Christ has fully done on the cross for your sins in your place, you're saved. You're accepted. And therefore, we obey. Really important. You can't mix those things around, okay? You can't mix those two around. It's not we obey, we obey, we obey, and therefore we're saved. It is we are saved. We are accepted. Therefore, we obey. Very important to understand, and this is really at the heart of why James is writing this. He's writing to admonish the church to live as first fruits. He's saying, hey, you're, you're a first fruit of the new creation. You belong to God, so act like it. Be who you are. Live as a first fruit. Amen? Amen. So now, with that as our foundation, now that we've got that as our foundation, everybody's got that foundation, right? You know who you are. Now, let's look at our text. Starting in verse 19, James is going to lay out for us what it looks like to live as a first fruit. What it looks like to live as redeemed and renewed children of God. Verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, Slow to anger. I just want to read that again. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Now, we're not going to spend too much time on this today because James is going to come back to this. He's going to spend actually most of chapter 3 addressing the issue of controlling our tongues and anger. Okay. But I will say that I think this is a, a very 
much needed verse right now. Right now. Especially because there are a lot of Christians who are being very slow to hear, quick to speak, and quick to even get angry with one another. Particularly over what's going on in America. There are, there are a lot of Christians that I see that are real quick to argue and to debate and even quarrel with one another about what's going on. Now, I'm not saying that Christians can't disagree with each other or have different opinions with each other. Certainly we can, but we need to be careful that our disagreements don't lead us to get angry with one another. And I was uh, reading a post on Facebook from a friend of mine who's a Christian, and uh, he was responding at the time when there was all the looting going on. There was a, a post about the looting, and he, he responded to it. Admittedly, he was also being quick to speak <laughs> and slow to listen, but he responded to it basically expressing his opinion that he didn't believe it was right to respond this way as Christians. Like, this is not the right way to respond as Christians, and perhaps there are many of us here that, that agree with that statement. Uh, but what happened, because he posted that, is, is members of his own family who are also Christians, they started to get real angry with him. Really angry with him. They started criticizing him publicly on Facebook, like I read it. Started attacking him. They started using harsh language. And at one point, one of them basically said, you know what, if you can't stand up for what is right, if you can't agree with me, I can't call you family anymore. Wow, right? that's exactly what I said. I was like, what? And, and that really broke my heart to see that. That Christian family members were willing to go that far, being so quick to speak and slow to really listen to each other in this spirit of anger and resentment. Now, now please don't misunderstand me. I'm not in any way saying that we shouldn't be angry over what happened. We should absolutely be angry about what happened to George Floyd and, and so many other African-American brothers and sisters in America. When we see things like that, it should upset us as Christians because it's not right. It's evil. It's wrong. And we should do what we can to stand against it. See, we don't believe in that. All men are created equal. Before the sight of God. All men have value. Precious in the Lord's sight. Everyone. So it's okay to get angry when you see injustice. We should. But there's a difference between righteous anger, which God approves of, and the anger of man that he does not. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 to 27... The Apostle Paul, he, he's actually quoting from Psalm 4. He says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So yes, it is right to be angry over injustice. It is right to be angry over oppression and evil. We should be angry when we see those things. But that anger should not lead us to sin. That anger should not cause us as Christians to hate one another, to want to tear each other down, to want to destroy each other with our words, to want to disown one another. It should not do that. That's giving an opportunity to the devil. That's the work the devil loves to do. He loves to destroy the church. He loves to do that. But God's not pleased with that at all. He's not pleased with that type of anger. Look at verse 20. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. In other words, it doesn't please God. The anger of man is not what God desires. And so let me just say, kind of just generally speaking to, to us here, if there's anyone here where you got some anger issues, you're, you're battling with anger. Maybe, maybe you're the type of person where, where the anger is always causing you to, to get caught up in the heat of the moment. And you just can't help yourself and you say things that really destroy people. Habitually, you do this. You hurt other people by your words because you're just angry. If that is you, you need to know that's not pleasing to the Lord. It's not. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, 
Anger, you know what anger is, according to Jesus? It is essentially the same as murder in your heart. That's really what anger is in the eyes of God. It's murder in, in seed form. That's what it is. And so if you've got a problem with anger, if you, people around you tell you, man, you're an angry person, like you've got anger issues, uh, the bad news is you've got a serious problem. <laughs> It's the one that you should take seriously. It's not just like, yeah, I get angry sometimes. No, you should take it seriously. Because the Bible takes anger very seriously. It says it's like murder in your heart. Take it seriously. That's the bad news. It's a serious, serious problem. But there is good news. Praise God. The good news is that God can and he wants to heal you of your anger. Like if you're here today and, and you're, you struggle with anger, you need to know uh, God can and he wants to heal you of your anger. He can do that. And he wants to do that. And the reason that uh, I know this is because this is exactly where James goes next in verse 21. Look at verse 21. He doesn't say there, the anger of man does not please God and so you're in trouble. <laughs> he says, therefore... Since the anger of man does not please God, therefore, what do you do? Put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. Literally take off the filth. Okay, it's this imagery of removing dirty clothes. James is saying take off the filthy clothes of sin. They do not belong to you anymore. They should not fit you anymore as first fruits. And then he says at the end of 21, he gives the prescription. What do you do then? Receive with meekness, the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. So you see what James' solution is to the anger, to the filth of sin? He's saying put away the anger, put away the filth of sin, and receive with meekness, humility, the implanted word. That's the gospel. Because the gospel has the power to save your soul. The gospel is the power to heal you of your sin. You need the gospel. But James says we have to receive it. He says receive it. Now, now the question is what does he mean by that? What does he mean receive the gospel? Like is he, does he mean believing in the gospel for salvation? Like, is he talking about uh, being saved by accepting the message of the gospel? Is he talking about conversion? No, he's not talking about that. Because he's not talking to unbelievers, is he? If, if we were all unbelievers, that would be the message. Receive the gospel. Believe in Jesus Christ. Put your faith in him and you will be saved. That would be the message. But he's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to Christians. Or at least Christians who claim to have already done that. We've already done that. So, what James means by receiving the implanted word, the gospel, is he means allowing the gospel to influence every part of our lives. Allowing the gospel to shape how we live as Christians. Allowing the gospel to make us humble and receptive to the demands that the gospel gives. Did you know that the gospel has demands on your life? Did you know that? Like Jesus is not just your savior, he's your Lord. Did you know that? A lot of times we don't like to think about that, but Jesus, he's your Lord. He's your commander. He tells you what to do. And if you believe in him, you, you submit yourself to him. That's one of the parts of the gospel, right? Because yes, we talked about this. The gospel says we are saved through faith in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We sing about it. We preach it all the time. But it also says, therefore, obey. Right? While these two statements, they can't be switched around as we talked about it. We cannot make the mistake of switching these things around. But at the same time, they also can't be separated from each other. You can't have one without the other. You can't. And the Apostle Paul, who's a proponent of the gospel, right, he would actually agree with James. He would. Because look at Ephesians chapter 2. This is a famous verse that we love. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. But then in the very next verse... 
Verse 10, hear what Paul says. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should what? We should walk in them. So we are saved for good works. We are saved to obey. And this is James's burden. Man, this is like his strong burden as he's writing this letter. He wants Christians to demonstrate true faith by obeying, by living out our calling as first fruits. And so he gets to the heart of the matter, heart of the matter in verse 22. This is the heart of the, ma- heart of the matter. Heart of the matter. <laughs> Said that kind of funny. Verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Do what you hear. Say it again to one another. Do what you hear. It's basically what James is saying. Do what you hear. Because if we only hear the word, if we only read our Bibles every day and go to church every Sunday and hear the sermon, and after sermon, after sermon, after sermon, and then we never do what the word says, James says, we are deceiving ourselves. We are self-deceived. Or to put it bluntly, our faith is not real. That's just a blunt way of saying it. There is something wrong with us. Look at verse 23. James says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. Now, if I were to come this morning and I just look really bad, let's just say like my hair looked like I just woke up, I have like snot running down my nose, got like boogers in my eyes, you know what I'm talking about, I hate those, shaving, shaving cream like still on my face, if I, if I did that, um, you would think that either I didn't look at a mirror before I came or I really don't care about my appearance. You would think one of those things. But assuming that I do care about my appearance, because I do, and if I told you uh, I did look intently in the mirror this morning, what would you say? You'd say, Eddie, you got a problem, man. <laughs> like, you got a serious problem. Like something is not right. You need to go back and look in the mirror and you need to do something this time, Right? And that's exactly what James is saying. To hear the word of God and and to never, ever, ever do anything about it is just like this. Something is wrong. It, It makes no sense. There's a problem. And the problem is you're self deceived. Your faith may not be genuine. Because true, genuine, Faith, you know what it looks like? Verse 25. He gives the contrast. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Simply put, true faith is to do what you hear. That is the one who is blessed. And so I want to, I know these are hard words, and I want us to take a moment right now if we could just humble ourselves before the Lord and and examine ourselves. Just go ahead and examine yourself right now. Ask yourself, is is my listening of the word of God, and that is very important, very, very important. We should be doing that. Listening to the word of God, is it leading to a growth in obedience? Am I growing in doing what I hear? Am I doing that? Can I see evidence of that in my life? I'm not saying you're perfect, right? None of us are perfect. Of course we fail. But generally speaking, can you, can you notice there's a pattern, there's a desire there where, yes, I'm seeking to, to live by what I know. Is that true? Or are you growing 
in the habit of listening and listening and listening and listening and forgetting and forgetting and forgetting and ultimately doing nothing that you've heard God say to you. If so, James warns us severely, you're self-deceived. I'm self-deceived. Doesn't matter how much you know. Doesn't matter how many sermons you've heard, how correct your theology is, how much Bible you've memorized. If our lives are not characterized by obedience to the Word of God, we're self deceived, James says. And if you think that James is being harsh, you're like, man, I don't like James. <laughs> like, I want to get out of this book. Like, I'm, I don't like James at all. If you think that he's being too harsh or too difficult, he's just basing his teaching on Jesus. <laughs> he is. He's just basing his teaching on what Jesus has already said. John chapter 14, verse 23 and 24. This is the word of Jesus, your Lord, my Lord. He says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Blessed is the man who keeps the word of God, right? And he says, whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Those who love Jesus, they do what he says. Do you do what he says? Do you do what he says? Now, in the last two verses, getting to the close, James, he's going to give us a few examples of what it looks like to do what Jesus says. So maybe you're asking, what does that mean to do what Jesus says? Well, James gives it to us, and and these are key themes, okay? Uh, James is going to return to these things again and again later, okay? This is like a key theme. These are key things that James is obviously really concerned about, okay? So we're not going to talk a lot about them because, because of time. It's already long enough uh, because we're going to come back to these things again and we can be convicted later. Um, but maybe as we read, just again, examine yourself, examine your life, and perhaps these are things that maybe the Lord is leading you to start doing. Maybe these are things that we can start growing in obedience to, okay? And so hear the word of the Lord, verse 26. It says, if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Okay. Now, by the way, when James, is, James uses the word religion, uh, he's not using it like in the negative way that a lot of people like to use it today. You know, religion is bad. He's not talking about uh, dead, heartless adherence to the, to, the, to the rules and regulations. He's not talking about that. He basically means faith, okay, genuine faith. Religion, faith. That's what he means. And so he's saying, if you can't control your mouth, if the way that you speak to others, it's, it's characterized by anger, like you're always hurting people with your words, you're always lashing out on them and destroying people, he's saying, your faith is worthless, okay? You're, you're self-deceived, and you need to bridle your tongue. <laughs> you need to work on that. And then in verse 27, our last verse, it says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. This is the faith that is pure and undefiled before God. Caring for orphans and for widows and keeping oneself unstained from the world. That basically means just walking in holiness, walking in purity. Now, this isn't, this isn't all there is to true faith. This is not like a comprehensive list, like, okay, I just do that, and then I've got faith. It's not like that. Uh, but certainly, faith without these things, it is, James says, worthless. Because special concern for the helpless and the vulnerable, it's a hallmark of God's people. It's a hallmark. I mean, we see that all throughout the Bible. God cares about the widows and orphans. He cares about the oppressed. He cares about the poor. And we should too. We should too. And he cares about holiness, okay? Holiness is very important to God as well. It's not just justice. I know there's a lot of, some, some churches tend to just only focus on that justice. It's only justice. But however you live, it doesn't matter. Just justice, right? No, God cares about justice and holiness. It's both, okay? So we, we can't be on this side just thinking, yeah, we got to be pure, we got to be holy, and don't care about justice at all. It's got to be both. Because God cares deeply about both. And so if our lives don't show any evidence of these things, like you're looking at your life like, man, I don't, it doesn't show any evidence, we really have to examine ourselves and be concerned 
as James is, with the genuineness of our faith. We should wrestle with this. Now, as we close up, uh, I know that this is not an easy message. Like I I confessed to you guys in the beginning, I warned you, (laughs) because it wasn't easy for me as well. And and honestly, the last thing, the last thing that I want to do is discourage those of you who need encouragement. Like, probably there were some of you who came today, you needed encouragement, and now you're just like, oh, (laughs) maybe, okay? Because I know, I know that there are some of you here today where you're really struggling with faith, okay? Like, like you're trying to live the Christian life, you're trying to obey Christ, but it's hard, right? The Christian life is hard. We fail. And and perhaps there are many of you who, who failed this week, maybe even this morning, and really the last thing that you need if you're trying to live for the Lord, but, but you're struggling, the last thing that you need is to start questioning your faith, okay? The last thing you need is to start doubting whether or not, oh my gosh, do I really have faith? That's the last thing you need. Okay? And so if that's you, if that's any of you here where you are pursuing the Lord, but you're struggling, man, you really just need encouragement, I just simply want to say to you and remind you that there is more than enough grace, more than enough mercy for all of your failures through the blood of Jesus Christ, Okay? Just make that clear. And so if that's you, you run to him. Go to him today. Let him remind you that you are not condemned because of your failures, because he was already condemned on your behalf. The penalty was poured out on him. So receive his grace. Be reminded of his mercy. Experience that grace again that the Lord, he knew that you would fail him. He knew. He saw all of that from eternity past, and he said, I'm still going to save you. I'm going to still set my eyes on you and make you mine because I love you. Be reminded of that today. Be encouraged. And then go and sin no more. Keep pursuing him. Keep fighting to run the race, wrestling with sin, saying no to temptation. Run by the grace of Jesus that is ample for you. Do that, okay? But for anyone here who maybe this word directly applies to. Anyone here who maybe you say you are a Christian and I've been a Christian for a long time and you've been going to church all of your life, you've read the Bible, you know your theology, you even understand the gospel, you know all the Bible memory verses, you have them, but there's really no evidence in your life that you're a Christian. There's really no fruit of obedience in your life. Maybe there's not even a pursuit or a desire to obey God. Then the word of God confronts you today. The word of God challenges you today. But but please understand that even for you, as I said in the beginning, I really hope that you don't leave here feeling condemned or, or dejected. I hope you don't do that because if you recognize right now, like if, if a light bulb went off and you recognize, man, my faith, I don't, I don't know if it's genuine. I don't know if it's pure. That is amazing grace from God right now that he's revealing that to you. It's incredible grace that he's telling you this right now because what he wants for you is that you'd have a genuine faith. A real faith. A saving faith. He doesn't want you to be self-deceived doesn't want that. Again, that's the worst place you could be, right? Self-deceived, thinking you're okay when you're not. He does not want that. And so in his grace, he's actually revealing this through this word. And he's calling you, he's calling me to do what you hear. Obey him. Not because you have to or else you won't be saved. Remember, that is not the gospel. Please do not walk out of here with that in your mind, that I have to obey to be saved. No, that's not the gospel. Do it because Jesus bled and died to save you. Do it because he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross, so that you could live as a first fruit. So that you could live in obedience to him. And so if that is any one of us today, I sincerely pray that you leave challenged, admonished to do what you hear. Not condemned because that's what the enemy wants to do, but challenged. That's good. That's good. So what I want to do right now is I want to I want to bow our heads and I'm gonna just close us in a prayer because I know that I'm sure that the, the spirit maybe is is rest, there's a wrestling in our heart for many of us. 
There's been a lot of examination today. It's not been easy. And I pray that it wouldn't just end right now because that would defeat the whole purpose of the message, right? I pray that it wouldn't be like, oh, that was a really hard message. And then I'm just going to go eat a taco and forget about it, right? That would, self-deception. Wrestle with this because the word of God is life. There's a reason that James calls the, the law the law of liberty. There's a reason he calls it that. That it's not a law to enslave you. It's not a law that's trying to destroy you. It's a law that brings life. When you obey the word of God, you experience blessing and life. Life as it was meant to be, as a first fruit. That's what you do. And not only that, it's a law of liberty because this law, it cannot condemn you anymore. You know that? You know that. If you're in Christ Jesus, the law cannot condemn you anymore. So it's not like you obey the law because I'm afraid if I don't obey the law, then I'm not a Christian. No, there's no more of that. It's a law of liberty. There is no fear of condemnation. You obey it because your Savior died for you. You want to do this. You want to please him. So I just want to pray for us right now that the Holy Spirit would move us in a, in a good way, in a gospel way to do what we hear. Father, first and foremost, thank you that you love us enough to give us hard, hard truths. You don't shy away from the hard stuff. You, you, you don't want us to be self-deceived. But you've given us your word that is like a mirror. When we look at it, sometimes we don't like what we see. But we know that your heart is that we would reflect beauty and perfection. That's where you're taking us. And so you give us these hard passages so that we could wrestle. And through it, we can be transformed more into the image of Jesus as we learn to obey and be conformed to the word of God. And so, Lord, we just want to thank you. Thank you for the gospel. <laughs> Thank you so much for the gospel because if it wasn't for the gospel, this would be the most devastating message ever. Because without the gospel, I mean, every single one of us here today, we would be condemned because we don't do what we hear all the time. We were all guilty of that. But thank you that through the gospel, through what Jesus has done for us, He's done what we could never do. He has fully fulfilled the law perfectly. And he has paid the penalty fully for our sins. So that now we could obey the law freely. Without fear of punishment. And, but willingly. And we can experience the freedom and the life that obeying your perfect law brings. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, we need your help. We, we really need your help. Help us. Help us. Help us. Our great helper, help us today at this very hour to do what we know you're saying to us. What you've maybe been saying to us for a long time. Help us today to do it. And Lord, I know there are, there are probably so many applications. I mean, there's so many different situations in this room. So Holy Spirit, I, I just pray that you would lead each and every person in their specific situation, whatever it is that you've been laying on their heart, whatever it is that you're speaking to them, help them by the power of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to live in obedience, to do what they hear. Do it for your glory, that we might reflect your glory that we might reflect the new creation that is coming in Christ. We might be first fruits. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.